Let's give him a big round of applause. CEO of Bitcoin.com. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So um, I was catch your attention early here by telling you that by the end of my talk, each and every one of you out there in the audience will be holding right there in your hands some cryptocurrency. So if you haven't used any yet and you've just been studying it and you're researching about it, well today is the day you're going to be the proud owner of some cryptocurrency here before the end of the talk. So all you need in order to claim that is any app on your iPhone or Android that can scan a private key. I'll recommend the Bitcoin.com wallet, but there's lots of other wallets that can do that as well. So I won't be offended one bit if you get out your phone right now and get it ready by installing the Bitcoin.com wallet in there. And in fact, every single one of you will have somewhere between one US dollar and 500 US dollars. And I'll tell you more about that at the end of my talk here. But uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I'm the first person in the entire world to start investing in this ecosystem. And uh, it's been, yeah, thank you. It's been more than... It's been more than eight years now, and it's been every single day, all day, for eight years, but I'm more excited about it now than ever before because so much is happening all across the world. And so I'm going to tell you about why I got excited about it more than eight years ago and what's happened so far in the space, the economic reasons why it's been happening, where we're at today, and where I think we're going in the future, and if there's time, some final thoughts and questions there. So we're going to start out with, well, what the heck is Bitcoin, right? We've all been hearing about Bitcoin and blockchain and this sort of thing. Well, what is this? Well, it's important to discuss what it is. And it's right there in the very title of the original Bitcoin white paper. And it's very, very clear. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. That means it's made for payments for people to buy and sell and trade things with people all over the world on the internet. Bitcoin is a cash system where you can send and receive money with other people. Bitcoin's not a company. It's not centrally controlled. It's not some proprietary system that's only for special people to get to use. It's not tied to any specific location. It's not only for people in Taiwan or only in London or only in New York. It's for everybody all over the entire world. And Bitcoin is not still the only cryptocurrency. There are literally thousands of different cryptocurrencies out there now. And they're all competing for share in the market and they're all working to make the lives of people better by providing them a useful service or something they can do with them. So uh, Bitcoin at this point has kind of become a generic name for all cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is a technology. Just like the, you know, computer science, right? Bitcoin is this whole new thing here. It's a protocol, it's a network, and it's a system that enables much, much, much more. And we're seeing that now by the fact that there's more than, you know, several thousand different cryptocurrencies, and they're all trying to enable slightly different things, or very different things in some cases. Uh, so there's just this entire ecosystem that's spawning all across the world, thanks to the invention of Bitcoin originally. And so Bitcoin is the world's very first scarce digital asset. Before the invention of Bitcoin, computer scientists thought that it was impossible to have a digital asset that's scarce and has limited supply. Like, how would that even be possible? But thanks to Satoshi Nakamoto, he figured out how to do it and it set off this whole revolution around the world. But it started much, much earlier. So these are two of the, the thinkers and the authors that I was reading as a young man back in the 1990s that basically described the idea of Bitcoin way back then, but they hadn't figured out how to do it technologically. And so up here on the screen here, we have a, a science fiction book by a famous science fiction author called Neil Stevenson. And I remember reading this book called Cryptonomicon as a young man. And in this book, there's these people and they're traveling around the world and they're using cyber cash to pay for things and they have secret hidden data centers and they're using this you know, internet money to pay around the world to do all sorts of things that was outside of the traditional banking system. And it was a really, really exciting science fiction book. And then you had people like Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman talking about that one of the major things that's missing for the internet and for increasing the amount of economic freedom people have in the world is a, a reliable e-cash or cyber cash for the internet. And so these people were talking about this decades before the invention of Bitcoin. So they saw it coming, they just didn't know how it would be created technologically, but Satoshi figured that part out. And in 2009, Bitcoin launched as an open source peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And I've emphasized repeatedly there that it's a cash system. Bitcoin is money. It's made for payments for people to be able to buy and sell things with people all over the world. 
and we saw people start to do that in 2010. There was a website that I'm sure many of you have heard of, it was called the Silk Road. And people started using that Bitcoin to buy and sell things on the Silk Road. And some of the things that they were selling were things that are illegal. But I heard about Bitcoin because of this marketplace for the first time. And I was personally never interested in any sort of drugs or anything like that. But when I heard that people were buying and selling drugs on the internet for Bitcoin, the question that I had wasn't how can I buy drugs too? The question was, what kind of money could they possibly be using to do this? Because we all know that you can't use credit cards or PayPal or your normal Bank of America account very easily to do these sorts of things. So I, I googled this website to figure out not about what they were selling but about how they were doing it. And that's how I heard about Bitcoin for the very first time. And in 2011, we saw more and more people start to get excited about it. And this is a chart of the price in 2011. And it looks kind of similar to a lot of the more recent price charts we've seen. But if you can read the really, really small print on the right there, we can see that the price scale on here is from $1 to $35. And so in the course of a couple of weeks, Bitcoin went from around $2 a Bitcoin to around $30 a Bitcoin. And everybody in the media and out there was all saying, this is a bubble. There's no way one Bitcoin could ever be worth $30 uh, a Bitcoin. And in the short term, they were right. The market crashed back down. But lots and lots of people all over the world realized that they were going to start using it for things in the, in the normal, above board market, right? And so this is a website I launched in 2012 because up to that point, everybody was complaining, Bitcoin, well, the only thing you can buy with it is drugs. Well, no, we set up BitcoinStore.com and we offered more than half a million consumer electronics products at prices cheaper than Amazon for the most part. And we only accepted Bitcoin for payments. We didn't accept credit cards. We didn't accept PayPal. We didn't accept anything other than Bitcoin. And we sold millions of dollars worth of these computer parts for Bitcoin. And that helped companies like Coinbase and all sorts of other companies start to be able to raise VC money because if you're buying and selling drugs on the internet, it's hard to raise VC money. If you're buying and selling legitimate goods on the internet, you can. And if you look at the numbers here, we can see that the entire year of 2013, less than $100 million worth of VC money was directed into the space. Today, there are lots of deals for one single company where there's more than that much money put into the space. And at the time, Coinbase was the largest single deal ever up to that point for 25 million US dollars. And that led us to 2014, in which we saw the number of websites around the world accepting Bitcoin for payments. It grew to over 100,000 websites. That's a lot of companies out there that were accepting Bitcoin for payment in 2014. Right? Five years ago, more than 100,000 companies were accepting Bitcoin for payments. And then something happened. Some people that were much newer to Bitcoin started saying that, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be using Bitcoin for payments. Bitcoin isn't a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. You should be using credit cards instead of Bitcoin. And they started pushing, pushing this giant false narrative that Bitcoin wasn't meant for payments, it wasn't meant to be used as cash, and that everybody shouldn't be using Bitcoin as money, they should be using credit cards instead. And for anybody that's paying any sort of attention at all, this is absolute nonsense. It's right there in the very title of the Bitcoin white paper. It's a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Yet somehow these people managed to get a lot of traction within the community and get uh, a lot of people to believe in that Bitcoin wasn't supposed to be able to be used as money and it's not supposed to be money for the world. But then we saw another thing happen. Oh, one more slide. Here's another person that's part of that same ilk saying that on Bitcoin, higher fees may be just what is needed. Implying that people shouldn't use Bitcoin as money and the fees should be high and the transaction should be slow and unreliable. And, and it's just mind-boggling to anybody that watched this happen uh, over the years within Bitcoin. And we saw, because of those people arguing that Bitcoin shouldn't be used as money and the fee should be high and the transaction should be low, so we saw Bitcoin's total share of the market cap of cryptocurrencies plummet. And we saw all sorts of altcoins all over the world start to get more and more traction. And the overall share of altcoins became bigger and bigger. Now there's thousands and thousands of other coins around the world all competing for market share there. And of course, in 2017, there was a split in that one single version of Bitcoin, where people that thought and knew and understood that Bitcoin was meant to be used as cash, 
They followed the Bitcoin Cash fork in the road. And the people that thought that Bitcoin transactions should have high fees and slow, unreliable transactions and that people shouldn't be using it for payments and that Bitcoin shouldn't be used as cash. They're on the chain that I call Bitcoin Core, but most of the world out there is still calling Bitcoin. But if you look at it, it's not the version of Bitcoin that became popular to begin with. The version of Bitcoin that became popular to begin with is the Bitcoin Cash version, thanks to having fast, cheap, reliable transactions and being meant to be cash for the world. And today, those are just two of the many thousands of cryptocurrencies that are competing for market share in the world. And uh, if you look at this chart here, the top chart there, that's the number of daily transactions. You can see that when the blocks became full, it was the first time ever in the entire history of Bitcoin in which there was a decrease in the number of transactions happening on the Bitcoin network. That had never, ever happened before in the entire history of Bitcoin. And that's because the blocks became full and the transactions became slow, expensive, and unreliable to use on Bitcoin. And so people moved to starting to use altcoins instead. And we can see Bitcoin's percentage of the overall market share just plummeted at that time. And all sorts of altcoins started to get more and more traction. And of course, we have to mention all the ICOs. And let's not touch the microphone equipment, please. And we can see that billions of dollars, billions of US dollars with a B, we'll try this one, Billions of dollars were raised for ICOs. And you'll hear a lot of people complain that ICOs are scams or ICOs are stupid or no, 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 no. Think for yourself here. ICOs are incredibly wonderful because it enables any investor anywhere on the planet to invest in any entrepreneur anywhere on the planet. And so that can enable all sorts of new businesses to come into existence that otherwise wouldn't have. So who knows when we're going to see the next you know, world-changing business that improves the lives of everybody. I predict that there'll be you know, not just one, I think there'll be many that come out of ICOs where investors somewhere in the world invest in an entrepreneur somewhere else in the world. And with that capital that they wouldn't have been able to raise through traditional capital markets, they're going to come up with something that's really amazing that empowers all of us to do more things in our lives. And that's one of the things that's so exciting about cryptocurrencies is they empower the individual to do what they want with their own money without needing permission. And one of the things that many people want to do with their own money is to invest it. And if you want to invest it in a risky ICO or an IEO or an STO or take your pick now, there's a bunch of different acronyms. It's your money to do it with. And because it's your money to do it with, it's your responsibility as well. So with that freedom comes the responsibility. So if you're thinking about investing in an ICO, do it responsibly. And don't put all of your investment eggs into one basket either. Have a nice, diverse portfolio. But of course, that was an amazing thing. And uh, I think ICOs and IEOs and you know all these things, I think that the pace of that's only going to increase with time because capital can now flow freely across the entire planet thanks to the invention of cryptocurrencies. And that brings us to substitute goods, right? So in economics, this is a term that refers to one good that can easily be substituted with another. So Colgate versus Crest toothpaste, Coke and Pepsi, Burger King and McDonald's, right? Coffee and tea. All these things, if the price of one becomes super expensive, people can switch to another. Or if one is no longer available, they can switch to another. Well, that's where we're at today in 2019. There's thousands and thousands of different competing substitute goods in the marketplace. So you have, of course, Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Cash, Ripple, Ethereum, EOS, Stellar, on and on and on, Dash, Monero, Zcash, Zcoin, the list goes thousands of coins long at this point, and they're all competing for share in the market. And my prediction is that the coins that are the most useful will be the ones that are used by the biggest number of people. And the same is true with any business, right? The businesses that are the most useful to their customers have the most customers. The crypto coins that are the most useful for people in the world will have the most users. So now I want to talk about why I chose to drop everything else in my life to focus on Bitcoin back in 2011 when they were just one single dollar each. And for people that don't know, I, I had a successful business in Silicon Valley selling uh, optical transceivers and networking equipment. And when I heard about Bitcoin, I thought this is a million times more exciting than you know, optical transceivers. 
And so I dropped everything in my life to focus on it. Well, I put together a spreadsheet showing exactly what it was that caught my attention here. And we can see that 2011, Bitcoin had all sorts of characteristics here. And the important ones are the things that made Bitcoin popular on the bottom there. And we can see that in 2011, Bitcoin was an electronic cash system. It had low fees with fast payments that were reliable, and the payments were irreversible. So you could, sit, and this is a speech I've been giving since 2011. I would tell people, Bitcoin allows you to send and receive any amount of money with anyone, anywhere, instantly, basically for free, and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. And nothing like that has ever existed before in the entire world. That's the speech I was giving back in 2011. And as we can see from the chart here, that speech is still completely true about Bitcoin Cash today, but is no longer true about the thing that everybody's calling Bitcoin today. So the thing that everybody's calling Bitcoin today, yeah, it has the Bitcoin name, but it doesn't have any of the fundamental characteristics that made Bitcoin popular to begin with. If I wanted to send you some of the BTC version of Bitcoin right now, the fees would be over a US dollar at least. And at the end of 2017, the average transaction fee on the Bitcoin network was over $50 in fees for a single transaction. And anybody with any business sense would be saying, this is an absolute disaster. Nobody's going to use this if the fees are $50 per transaction. People are going to use credit cards or PayPal or, or some other cryptocurrency. And the part that was even more mind-boggling about the fees being allowed to get to $50 each is that we had the Bitcoin core BTC thought leaders out there on social media saying, hooray, the fees are $50 each. They're literally talking about popping champagne bottles to you know, have toast to the fact that the fees are $50 each and that they can't wait for the fees to become $100 or even $1,000 each on top of the Bitcoin network. Well, for anybody who studied economics or has even an ounce of business sense, you realize that the fees are never going to get to $1,000 sustainably on BTC. People are going to switch and use one of these you know, 1,001 different competing substitute goods or altcoins. And I think one of the ones that's right there at the front of the lead there of the charge to be there wanting to serve customers and be useful for the world is Bitcoin Cash, as we can see here in the chart, because it has all of those characteristics that made Bitcoin popular to begin with. And those characteristics mean that digital currency may be the most effective way the world has ever seen to increase economic freedom. If this happens, the implications are profound. It could lift many countries out of poverty, improve the lives of billions, that's billions with a B, improve the lives of billions of people around the world, and accelerate the pace of innovation in the world. And that's a quote from Brian Armstrong, the founder of Coinbase. And here we have a very clear chart of the amount of economic freedom in the world ranked by countries, by both the most economic freedom and the least economic freedom. We, we can see here very clearly the countries with the most economic freedom are countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, and Switzerland. And I think Taiwan's actually pretty high up on that list as well. Uh, the countries with the least amount of economic freedom around the world are countries like North Korea, Venezuela, and Cuba. And it's very clear, if you look at those two lists, which one of those lists you would rather live in. And it's the countries with more economic freedom. And sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. And we can see Hong Kong in the 1950s. And in just a few short decades, it went from being a little sleepy port town into being a world-class economic powerhouse. And we can see Havana, Cuba, a place with very little economic freedom. And in that same time frame, not much changed at all. And so those are very, they started out as very similar cities. And in just a few short decades, Hong Kong is this amazing world-class economic powerhouse. And it's because of the amount of economic freedom that was available to people in Hong Kong and that was not available to people in Cuba. And so why is economic freedom important? Well, it leads to a higher per capita income, higher life expectancy, higher literacy rates, better income for the poorest 10% in society, fewer wars and violent conflicts, all sorts of fantastic things for everybody all over the place. And here we have charts showing the direct correlation there. The income level of the poorest 10% in society is substantially higher in countries with more economic freedom than in countries with less economic freedom. And we can see the income per capita overall is much, much, much higher, almost 10 times higher in countries with more economic freedom than in countries with the least amount of economic freedom. 10 times higher. That's huge. And we can see adult literacy rates. More people know how to read in countries with more economic freedom. 
and life expectancy, people live longer in countries with more economic freedom. Not just a little bit longer, you can see it's almost 20 years longer people are able to live in countries with more economic freedom than in countries with less economic freedom. I'm 40 years old today, half of my life is 20 years up to this point. People live 20 years longer on average in countries with more economic freedom than with less. And people have more jobs in countries with more economic freedom. When it's easier to start a job, more people are able to, to get a job from these businesses where, where people can do it than in countries with less economic freedom. And of course, when you have more money and more economic freedom, you can afford for more child care when you're having a baby. Fewer babies die at childbirth in countries with more economic freedom. So if you love babies, you should be advocating for more economic freedom in the world because fewer babies will die at childbirth. And it's not just a slight difference, it's a huge difference. And of course, children in the labor force. In countries with more economic freedom, they have a higher standard of living. You have fewer kids forced uh, to work in the labor force from a very young age. And correlation doesn't prove causation, but when we see example after example in both theory and in practice over and over again of more economic freedom leading to better results for rich and poor alike, we can make some really, really strong inferences. And that brings me to Bitcoin Cash's impact on economic freedom, because it makes it easier to start a business and force property rights to send and receive money with anyone anywhere in the world, and it enables people to opt out of corrupt freedom, uh, corrupt systems. That's fantastic for everybody all over the planet. And so Brian Armstrong says, if we can create more economic freedom in the world, it will serve as a giant economic stimulus package, accelerate innovation, reduce wars, make the poorest 10% better off, overthrow corrupt governments, and raise happiness. Great quote, great goals. And I say that Bitcoin Cash and digital currencies are the best tools the world has ever seen to accomplish these goals. Who's excited about bringing more economic freedom to the world and improving the lives of every human being on the planet? I know I am. Well, we can all get started. If you look under your seat right now, hiding on the floor, you'll see a ticket like this. On each and one of these, it's, it's hiding under there. If you dig under your seat, on each and every one of these tickets, this is a private key right here on the ticket. And every single one of these on your thing here is unique. And there's somewhere between one and 500 US dollars worth of Bitcoin cash on this ticket. Each ticket has the money on there. So if you have two tickets like this guy in the front row, he can claim the money twice, right? Each ticket is only claimable once. There's a unique private key on each ticket there. All you have to do is scan it with the Bitcoin.com wallet or any other wallet. It can scan, import a private key, and you'll get somewhere between one and five hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin cash. And that's the end of my time. But I was the first person in the entire world to start investing in this ecosystem because I want to enable every single human being on the planet to be able to transact financially with every single other human being on the planet without any permission from anybody, because that makes everybody's life better off. So if you're excited by these ideas, and you're excited about making the world a better place, please tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody you know about it, because the faster we can get everybody using cryptocurrencies in their lives, the faster we can increase the rate of economic growth of the entire planet and lift everybody up out of poverty and make the entire world a better place for everyone, everywhere. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Roger.